Well, good morning to everyone. If you have your Bibles with you today, which I hope you do, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4. We're continuing our study through the book of Acts. And chapter 4 really is a a continuation of of chapter 3. These chapters, just the story, it's just all one story. It's a long story and they all go together. Peter and John, last week you remember, they were walking to the temple during the hour of prayer. And they came upon a gate. It was known as the beautiful gate just before you enter into the temple. And there they saw a man who was begging alms at the gate, this gate called beautiful. And Peter told the man, he said, look at me. And he said, silver and gold, I have none. But what I do have, I will give to you. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And immediately the man was healed and he went into the temple. I mean, he was obviously jumping up and down and praising the Lord. They went into the temple together, the three of them, John and Peter and this, this healed man. They prayed together. When they came out of the temple, the, the healed man, this beggar, he was holding on to Peter and to John. He wouldn't let him go. And they walked out of the temple area and they walked outside of that gate. Now the whole Temple Mount, all the people that were gathered on the Temple Mount at that time, they were all just buzzing about what had happened. As they went into the temple together, um, everybody started talking about what had happened to this man, who they all knew. And as they came out of the temple, they all gathered around them. They went to a place called Solomon's Porch, which is not far from the temple. It's kind of on the edge. I showed a picture last week of the Eastern Gate. And that's where Solomon's porch was located all along that that side of the Temple Mount. All the people gathered there. They wanted to look at this man that was healed. Peter preached the truth to the people. It was not Peter and John who healed this man, but it was this man's faith in the name of Jesus Christ that healed him. The beginning of chapter 4 picks up as Peter is in the middle of his sermon. Verse 1 says, now as they spoke to the people... The priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. What we see here in chapter 4 is the very first persecution of the church age. Peter, Peter was in the middle of his sermon. Verse 1 says, as they were speaking to the people. So while Peter and John, they were preaching, they were, they were speaking the truth. These priests, the captain of the temple, they suddenly interrupted them. In mid-sentence, suddenly a bunch of priests in their fancy robes came upon them. Verse 2 says that they were greatly disturbed because they were preaching that Jesus rose again from the dead. Now everybody else is rejoicing about this incredible miracle that has happened. This poor beggar that they all knew had his ankles restored, his legs restored, and he, he could now walk. But these religious leaders, they were very upset because of the name of Jesus. Verse 3 says that they laid hands on them and arrested them. But not before another 2,000 people heard the word of God and believed in Jesus. This is why they were upset ultimately. There's now 5,000 people in Jerusalem who are now professing Christians. And this was a, a big problem for the ruling class, the priestly class called the Sadducees. And as we read on what happens next, we're going to see why this was very disturbing to them. Verse 5 says, and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So verse two says that they were greatly disturbed because they were teaching in the name of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Now the doctrine of the resurrection was particularly disturbing to the Sadducees because they rejected the resurrection. They didn't believe in life after death. This particular uh, portion of the Jews, you know, the Jewish faith was divided between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sadducees did not believe in the, in the resurrection. But the name of Jesus was equally appalling to this group of men. Because after all, look at the names. 
These are the very, very rulers, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas. This was the same ruling body. That just a few weeks before, six to eight weeks before, Jesus stood in front of these men. It was these men that Jesus faced whenever he was arrested. These are the men that spat on his face, slapped him, abused him, mocked him, and ultimately turned him over to Pontius Pilate to be put to death. And now here we are six to eight weeks later and there's miracles being done in his name. His followers are claiming that he was resurrected from the dead. Now this was very difficult for them to refute. It was very dangerous for them as well. Now the Sadducees, they were again the, the ruling elite class at this time. They were the political rulers as well as religious rulers in Israel. They were very friendly with the Romans. That's why they were in power because they were the portion of Judaism that was very favorable towards Roman rule. And the Romans supported them politically so they, they, they valued that power that they had, that influence. The other thing about the Sadducees is they were theological liberals. They did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in the resurrection. They really didn't believe in anything except their traditions and their worldly power. Jesus threatened that power in his time, so they conspired to kill him. And now the followers of Jesus were threatening that power and wealth. And now they have to deal with Peter and John, the rest of the disciples. They were theological liberals. They rose up much later than the time when Judaism was originally founded. And they latched themselves on to that great religious tradition. You know, this is how theological liberals always work. When I say liberals, I'm talking about religious liberals here. Theological liberals do not build anything. But they act like leeches. And they attach themselves onto a living organism and then they suck the life out of it. This is what happens over and over again, over the life of a religious institution, whether that is a church or a college or a seminary, there's a natural tendency towards theological liberalism. It just kind of flows in that direction. I'll tell you why. It's because Satan is a very real being, so are demons. And their influence and the influence of the world is very real and it puts pressure on Christians and on churches and on these religious organizations. Satan is trying to destroy anything that is true. This is how it works. It's always been this way. They creep in over time. They become established. Once they are established, they entrench themselves by multiplying their number. Once they are strong enough, they go in for the kill by putting themselves in control, manipulating things, marginalizing anybody who believes that the Bible is the literal word of God. It's always been this way. It's happened in every major denomination. It's happened in the Southern Baptist Convention. It's happened in all religious groups. Now, these Sadducees, they, they did not build Judaism. That was the work of Moses and the prophets. It was the work of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Hosea and all the prophets. They are the ones who built Judaism and built that faith. And their descendants were the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they, they were the religious conservatives. But by this time in the first century, they were extreme fundamentalists. They had lost the ability to govern effectively. They were so bogged down by all of their religious traditions, all of their man-made traditions. They had no spirit. They had no personal relationship with God. You see, that's the danger of becoming on the other end of the spectrum, too fundamentalist. They just end up turning everybody off. You know, these Sadducees, they became the leading religious sect. And those two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they opposed one another, but they were both united in opposing Christ. Neither one of them believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But the Sadducees being the leading political power, they were very jealous of that power. So they marginalized Jesus. They called him an extremist. They killed him. And now they're going to try to do the same to Peter and John, his followers. Verse 3 says that they put them into custody. The next day the trial began. In verse 6, again, notice it's the same men, Annas and Caiaphas, the same men who condemned Jesus. Now they've convened the Sanhedrin to deal with Peter and John. You know, it was whenever Jesus stood before this same group of men, six or eight weeks before. Peter, remember where Peter was? He was on the outside in the courtyard. And he denied Christ. He denied, he denied even knowing Jesus three times. 
And then the cock crowed, which is exactly what Jesus said would happen. Here he is in the same place, verse 7. Imagine how Peter felt at this moment that this question was put to him. By what power or what name have you done this? Peter was waiting for that. I bet it was like a breath of fresh air. In fact, verse 8 says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit at this moment. And by being filled with the Spirit, it means the Spirit of God moved within him. Imagine how he felt. Peter was longing for this day. Peter was the one who had denied Christ three times. And no doubt there was regret there. He had, he had made his promise to Jesus. He said, I'm not going to deny you, even if I have to die with you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Now he had a chance to redeem himself, prove himself. But this time he's not operating in the flesh alone. Now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, aren't you glad that God did not give up on Peter? Peter denied him. Man, aren't you glad that God did not give up on you? God is long-suffering. He looks on the heart. He looked on Peter's heart. He knew that Peter was just weak and in the flesh. He wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. He acted out of fear. He didn't give up on Peter. You see, whenever we come back to him in tears and repentance, Christ Gives us his tender mercies. He loves us. Now here's Peter standing before the same man who condemned Jesus. The same group that caused such fear in him that he denied even knowing Christ. And now they're asking him, in what name did you heal this man? And beginning in verse 8, Peter stands witness to the great Sanhedrin. Verse 8 says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Here we see Peter's bold witness. And here we see Peter living up to his name. You know, before he had the Holy Spirit, he was named Simon. He was a man of the flesh, a fisherman. But now, because the Holy Spirit is in him, he is Peter. That is, he is a rock filled with the Holy Spirit. And he boldly shares the name of Jesus Christ. You know, during this long night before the trial, you can imagine what Peter and John and their conversations, they recalled the promises that Jesus made to them. For example, in Luke 21, Jesus promised them. He says, they shall lay their hands on you and bring you before kings and governors for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. And in Matthew 10, 20, Jesus said something similar to his disciples. He says, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what, is, what it is that you ought to say. And here Peter is, and he's fulfilling this verse. He's found it to be true. He's arrested, taken before the rulers, filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter didn't have to worry about how he was going to answer their questions because Peter was simply witnessing or testifying to the truth. He didn't have to pretend to be knowledgeable. He just had to speak what he knew to be true. So the rulers asked, what power, by what name have you done this? You know, three times in this text, we, mentioned, we see the mention of the word name. By what name have you done this? What authority? You know, the Jews put a lot of emphasis on the, on the names of God, on the name of God. And they held it with such reverence. They wouldn't even write his name. They wouldn't even speak the name Yahweh because they had held it in such high regard. Peter, by whose name did you do this? You know, in verse 9, Peter says, if we're being judged today because of a good deed done to a helpless man, if you're asking me how it is that this miracle occurred, how this man that you see, because the man was there, he's there standing. You're asking me what name that this man is standing before you. Verse 10, 
by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Peter boldly proclaims the name that is above every name. Say, you know, saying it in the way that he said it just made it more stinging to these, to these uh, religious elite who were, had him on trial. You know, saying Jesus' name alone was ex- extremely offensive to them. For, again, this is the same group of people that spat on his face and abused him and killed him. They didn't want to hear the name Jesus. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They did not want to hear his name. They wanted it to go away. But not only that, but Peter said, this is Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. That word Christ, that's the Messiah. The Messiah that they say that they all believe in, that the Messiah that's going to come. The promised one of Israel calling Jesus Messiah was doubly offensive. Peter said it was in his name that this man stands before you whole today. Verse 11, Peter quotes from the word of God, Psalm 118, the rejected stone has become the chief cornerstone. Verse 12, Peter says very plainly and clearly, there's no salvation apart from Christ. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved, must be saved in the name Jesus Christ. You know, if we're ever called on to testify, and all of us as Christians, we're going to be called on to testify. Maybe not after being arrested before a government. Hopefully that does not happen to us, that level of persecution. You're going to be called on to testify by your friends, by your coworkers, by your neighbors. Anybody that knows you're a Christian, if they're not a Christian, you're called on to testify to them. They want to know how to go to heaven. What happens after I die? This is what we say. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You know, there's always opposition to the gospel, but Christians are called to stand strong, to make a good witness, even if it costs us. You know, there's always going to be pressure for us to tone down our message, especially in our private life, in our personal life. And those that we, there's always pressure placed upon us to not speak the name of Jesus, to, to keep certain things to ourselves. You know, the fact is the world does not like to feel condemned. Unbelievers in the world, they don't want to feel condemned in their sin. There's always pressure to tone things down, pressure on us. You know, we heard a lot over the last few years, you know, attacks on, on Bible-believing clergy in the, in the armed forces. You know, these guys are under a lot of pressure to conform, sometimes to be more universal in their approach. You know, it's always been that way, I suppose, for chaplains in our armed force. I see Ken Brown here. Ken Brown's a chaplain in in our armed force. He's a colonel, actually, and he knows. There's always, there's, you know, certain officers will stand against them, and sometimes Southern Baptist chaplains have a very difficult time. And this has been going on for years and years. A long time ago, I read about a chaplain who stood strong, preached the, the true gospel, in an army chapel, he denounced sin in the camp. But that particular camp had a commanding officer who loved to party, and he, he would supply these young men in his, under his charge, supply them with alcohol and provide the way for them to party. And then this chaplain's preaching the gospel and preaching against sin, and it was offending the, the commanding officer. So he called him in and said, look, you gotta stop preaching like this. And all he was doing was just condemning sin and telling people the way of salvation. You know, this chaplain, he was under a lot of pressure to conform. He wouldn't do it. His commanding officer uh, ultimately discharged him, sent him, sent him away, um, put him in a different position. And then he sent off to the, the commander who was over the chaplains, and he sent word to the chief of the chaplains, and he said, don't send, send I need another chaplain because I got rid of mine. Send us another chaplain. Just don't send any Southern Baptists. They're too evangelistic. But you can imagine the temptation on that army chaplain to just tone down his message, right? Just play the game a little bit, to tone it down. Peter felt that pressure. Here he is standing before the very men who killed Jesus. He has a decision to make. How am I going to present this to this group of men? I'm not going to deny the truth, but maybe I can tone it down a little bit. No, he didn't tone it down. There's no other name. This this man was healed by Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. 
You know, Paul said in Romans 10, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. John wrote in his gospel in John 20, 31, but these are written that believing you might have life through his name. Listen, Christians, we bear witness to the name of Christ. We're, we're called on to witness to the lost, to give testimony. You know, Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified, the same was raised from the dead. And he's the only one who can take away your sin and make you whole. This is our message. In verse 10, Peter said, it was the name of Jesus Christ that this man stands before you. This man, he was 40 years old. Everybody in Jerusalem knew him. Jerusalem was not like a, a city of 10 million people or something. I mean, they knew this man. They walked by him. He's standing on his feet. And Peter said, look at this man. Faith in the name of Jesus did this. You know, the, the best defense that we can give to our faith, and we're all called on to defend the faith, and God's given us all the tools that we need to answer the, the, the questions of the critics. And it's all given right here in this story. The best defense that we can give of our faith is the resurrection of Christ along with changed lives. You know, Peter pointed to, the, to this healed beggar standing there and essentially said, this man standing here is proof that Jesus Christ is alive. They had the benefit of seeing this man with their own eyes. But it's the same testimony that we give. The resurrection of Christ is the basis of our faith. And the changed lives are testimonies of it. You know, there was a famous evangelist a long time ago named Samuel Chadwick. And he would go, he was one of these old school evangelists. He'd go from town to town. They'd set up tents or he'd go in churches and they would have revivals. And they would preach the gospel. And he used to pray. He said, I used to pray for a Lazarus in every single campaign. Some great sinner whose conversion would shock the whole community. He got the idea from John chapter 12, you know, the chief priests, these, these same guys who Peter is standing before. In John chapter 12, they were conspiring together about killing Jesus, but they also conspired together about killing Lazarus. Lazarus, remember, was the man that Jesus raised from the dead. They wanted to kill Lazarus because verse 11 of that passage says, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So Chadwick, this famous evangelist, he, he prayed for a Lazarus to be saved in every revival he did. <coughs> he wanted a miraculous salvation. You know, God, he says, God answered my prayers in every one of those meetings. Infamous, wicked men trusted Christ and became witnesses through their changed lives. The whole town would see that this person was changed. You know, all these people in Jerusalem, they looked at this crippled beggar, and now they see him standing before them. And as a result of that, they all have to make a decision. They all have to decide whether or not they're going to believe in Jesus. That's the power of a changed life. Even today, that's the power of a changed life. That's all of our testimonies. You're here today, most as Christians, if you're a born-again believer, that's your testimony. You are the changed life. You are the witness of the resurrection. That's the story of my life. You know, before I was 21 years old, whenever I committed my life to Christ, you know, there's people back that knew me back then. If you went and talked to those people, even to this day, they still, whenever they find out what I do, they can't believe it. I can't even believe it. But that's your testimony. That's all of our, our testimonies. The way I lived before, before I was saved, now I'm different. It's the same for many here today. You know, you were one way before you were with Christ. Now you're a different person. Everyone knows you. Everyone who knows you, they're watching you. You need to be standing before them different. This is why we're called on to leave the world, to come out and to be different. Because they're watching how you live. That is your witness. And everyone who knows you, when they see the difference that Christ makes in your life, the difference that he has made in your life, it's, they're going to look. They have to make a decision about Christ right then and there. Either they're going to believe or they're going to harden their hearts. But here's the truth. If you go back and you live like you used to live. And by the way, if your testimony is that you were raised up in church your whole life, and some people ask their testimony, I never did anything wrong. I was in church my whole life. You should praise God for that. That's the most powerful kind of testimony to unbelievers in the world. To see a person who's lived their life, they come from a godly family, raise them to know the truth, and they walk in it and live differently. That's the, it's, all, it's about being different from the world. 
But here's the truth. If you go back, though, and live like you used to live, you know, imagine this beggar, this crippled beggar who was healed. Imagine if a week later or a month later or even a year later, somebody's walking up on the Temple Mountain. They're going through the beautiful gate, entering into the temple, and that beggar was back there again, crippled. If he, had gone back, if, he would have, if he would have lost his healing and gone back and become crippled again, everybody would have rejected Christ. They would have known it was not true. They would have claimed, they, they, would, have, they would have saw that the claims of Peter and John were not true. If that crippled beggar, beggar had gone back to being crippled. But if they see him completely changed, if they see this man healed and get baptized, and come into the church and live it and grow in it and walk in it. They all have to make a decision. That's, that's what we do. That's why we have a church. That's why you come in and you join the church. That's why you, you, it's a picture of leaving the world and coming in. Being in the world but not of the world. Submitting your life to fellow believers. God uses that as a testimony, as a means to call, call the world to salvation. All right, look what happens next. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside, to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But so it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them to not speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Here's what we get from this is we must speak. Peter says in verse 20, we must speak. You know, this was the first persecution of the church age, the first of many, many others. And we have seen that Peter was bold in his witness, and now we see he's fully committed to Christ, regardless of whatever it is that's going to happen to him. Back in verse 13, it says that the council heard the words of Peter. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. They realized that they had been with Jesus. And then they look over at this poor beggar who has been healed standing there. There was nothing that they could say. All they could do was marvel at it. You know, the irony of this passage, it's very clear. You know, Peter and John, here they are. They're the ones on trial and they're speaking boldly and confidently and in faith. And those who arrested them, those who brought them before them, their accusers, they're just sitting there in stony silence. They were amazed. They were all just quiet. They they, they were processing what they were seeing and what they were hearing. They saw, they heard the boldness of Peter and John. They knew that they were uneducated. They were untrained, but they heard their conviction. They spoke so eloquently about Jesus and 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 this man who was healed. They were just common men. They were fishermen, untrained, uneducated. They were not seminarians. They were not trained in the rabbinical schools of this time. But they spent three powerful years with Jesus. They'd seen him. They experienced the power of the resurrection. And they were not going to flinch when they were under fire. And these guys were blown away by how eloquent they were. How confident they were. Because they were standing on truth. And we should be no different. Listen, don't be intimidated by the critics. or The cynics. You know, some people, they're watching to see if your Christian faith is real. In fact, you know, at the office or at school, sometimes people, are, they're just going to throw stuff at you just to see if you'll stand. Because they look in their own hearts. They want truth. They want to know that they're saved. And they're going to test you as a Christian, challenge you. And how you respond is going to be a powerful testimony of the resurrection. We must speak what we know is true. We, all have, we have all the proof that we need. We have the resurrection of Christ. We have the evidence of countless lives changed through Christ. You know, this passage before, so it's one of the most powerful proofs that Jesus rose again, just using reason. You know, Peter, just weeks after the death of Christ, is now standing before the very men who killed Jesus. 
And he's claiming to have seen Jesus alive along with 500 other witnesses. People are being healed in the name of Jesus. Now there's 5,000 people in Jerusalem who are Christians. Don't you think that the Sanhedrin, these educated religious men who oppose Christ and oppose these followers of Jesus, don't you think that if they could have produced the dead body of Jesus, they would do it right now? Absolutely they would. This is one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection. They could not produce the dead body of Christ. It was gone. Not only that, you know, what did Peter and John, what could they have possibly expected to benefit from going into Jerusalem and preaching that Jesus Christ was alive? What could they have possibly thought that, they were, that that was going to benefit them in any way, shape, or form? What did they expect? Listen, I'll tell you this. This is what they expected. They expected to be crucified. And they went and did it anyway. They, that was the only motivation. They believed that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And they expected to be crucified for it. In fact, Peter ultimately was crucified. He died on an upside down cross in Rome. You know, the skeptics are on the defense, not us. They, they are the ones that have to answer these questions. How do you explain the presence of the church? Here we are 2,000 years later. Why is the church, why did it spread across the whole world? It's because of this right here. Listen, you don't need a PhD in order to witness to people. You just need to know the truth and to be willing to stand and to speak. In verses 16 and 17, the Sanhedrin, they send out Peter and John. They deliberate among themselves. They conclude that they cannot deny the miracle. They therefore have resolved to severely threaten Peter and John that they might keep it from spreading any further. Verse 18, they call in the apostles and command them to stop preaching. <clears throat> and you can imagine these guys. They're commanding the apostles to stop preaching. Y'all excuse me, I'm going to take a drink. In verse 18, they call the apostles, they command them to stop preaching. <clears throat> Think of these guys, man. Can you imagine setting yourself up against God, to fight against God? Don't preach in the name of Jesus, they said. You know, verse 20 should be the testimony of every born-again believer in the church today. Peter said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I cannot keep myself from telling others about what I have seen and heard. Listen, we're only going to tell other people so, something that's very important to us. If you go up and you talk to someone, if you're motivated to go and start a conversation, you're going to speak things that matter to you, things that you know about, things that are important or interesting to you. Do you ever have the desire to tell somebody about Jesus, the truth of the resurrection, to engage people in a conversation about Jesus? Do you ever challenge somebody, do you, what do you believe about Jesus and the resurrection? Do you ever feel motivated to speak about Jesus to someone? Or is that just strangely missing from your life? You know, if you never feel the desire to tell others about the greatest news in the world, you know, we, we hear that phrase, the great, we hear that in church, we kind of just gloss over. The greatest news in the world. It is the greatest news in the world. We're all sinful. We're all separated from God, all of mankind. And there is a pathway. There is a free gift that God's willing to give us of salvation. You can live in eternity in heaven because the fact is you're going to die. And you have the option of living for an eternity in heaven if you'll put your faith in Christ. If you don't speak that truth, you're not where you need to be in your spiritual walk. Listen, a silent Christian, you know, there. The, a silent Christian, there, there are no silent Christians except dead Christians. The only silent Christians are Christians who are dead. Because a Christian who is born again, who has the Holy Spirit, who knows the truth, they cannot but help to speak the truth about Christ. And so I'd ask you, are you dead or are you alive? If you're an alive, born again Christian, you must speak. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you. <clears throat> God, I pray that uh, you'll just take your word and use it according to your will. Your will never comes back void. 
This word is for us as Christians. We need to stand up and speak. And I pray for Jefferson Baptist Church, God, in the name of Jesus, you'll raise us all up, make us bold in our faith. And I pray for all those here, those who need to make decisions for Christ. God, Holy Spirit, may this be the day that you bring them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.